Hello, welcome back to Lit Life with Miranda Reads. Today we're going to be talking about big boys. And by my definition, big boys are books that are over 450... <laughs> Why do you betray me? Okay, fine. Okay. I don't know about you, but like when I'm reading and I'm looking for books at the library or at the bookstore, if the book is above a certain length, I find myself a little bit hesitant on whether or not to read it. And it's just because it requires more of a commitment. And I also find myself getting more disappointed if it ends up like not panning out. So what I... <laughs> For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna do standalone books only. Something I do wanna make clear is that this is not author bashing. This is just me sharing my opinion about whether or not a book is worth X amount of pages. I'm gonna do my best to stay away from like the big things, but I might mention things in the beginning, middle, or end that ended up affecting my judgment. Oh, what is this you may ask? It is my Agatha Squamish mug. Technically this was a Christmas present to my husband, but we're in the same house and therefore I get to use the mugs. So without further ado, we're gonna start off The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn. In this book, we have Anna Fox. She lives alone in a New York estate. One day, a new family moves in across the way. She notices one night that it looked like someone was being stabbed. However, because she's an unreliable narrator, she was drunk at the time. She has all kinds of mental health problems, like very agoraphobic, very anxiety prone. So no one ends up taking her seriously, and the more she insists, the more she looks like she's just lost it. So this one I'm a little bit torn on, because if you have not read The Woman in Cabin 10, and if you have not read The Girl on the Train, The Woman in the Window is probably going to be pretty good for you. And why I'm saying that is because The Woman in Cabin 10, The Girl on the Train, and this one are all extremely similar. So we all have a unreliable narrative. They have either a drinking or a substance abuse problem. They witness a murder or a disappearance, and then they have to like try and piece together from their memories what happened. On the one hand, reading it once, so like my first time I read through this kind of idea was The Woman in Cabin 10. I thought it was a pretty good book. However, by the time I got to The Woman in the Window, it kind of lost its charm. I will say that this one did have a few moments that did kind of get to me that I liked quite a bit, but the actual like writing and the formation of the book, it's just so similar that by the time I read this one, it just, it didn't work for me. And I just wish I could have gotten that time back. So now we're gonna be hitting some old school books published in 2001, The Life of Pi by Anne Martel. This one is 460 pages. This one's a little bit hard to get into because the author has it set in like very distinct sections. So Pi and his family own a zoo. You spend the first part of the book where Pi kind of runs around finding his self and religion. The second part is where Pi and his family are on the boat traveling to a new land, I believe it's Canada, I wanna say. And the boat ends up sinking Pi gets stuck on a lifeboat with a tiger. And then the third part of the book is, um, and this is where the spoilery bits come in, so if you want to just skip ahead 30 seconds. The third part is where you figure out like whether or not the trip on the boat was real. And that was what kind of ruined it for me, if I'm going to be completely honest here, because I really liked the adventure, and that really engaged me. And then at the very end, I didn't like how the author kind of like just reversed everything and planted these seeds of doubt and then tried to connect it to the beginning with a religion aspect. And then also, this is like really minor, but like as someone who really loves listening to audiobooks, the fact that um, the whole part of the tiger story was supposed to be told in like one to two hours and then the audiobook was like way more than that. Really? You you told that whole part in just a few hours, but like I'm listening to literally the audiobook and it's way longer. I'd say this one is worth it for one round if you're kind of curious about that middle section. 
but the beginning and the end really just kind of soured it for me. The Female Persuasion is written by Meg Walzer. We follow Greer Kadeksky and a few other people as they find out what feminism means to them and then how it affects their careers. And this one wasn't worth it to me because it just never felt like it went anywhere. It, this is, never comes together. It never forms a cohesive story for me. And by the end of it, I was just kind of left going, well, I finished the book. His name was Zach. This one clocks in at 486 pages. This is a zombie survival story. It follows Zach, a former member of the military, and it's been about two years since the zombie apocalypse happens. Since that happens, he finds a girl, Abby. She was alone and he kind of like takes her under his wing as like a father figure. And one of my favorite things about this book was the dynamic between Zach and Abby. I feel like there's a lot of stories where it's teenagers banding together, there's adults banding together, but I like the dynamic of a adopted father, adopted daughter like kind of forming their own family and then taking care of each other. And I thought that was a very sweet um, angle to the book and it ended up making my enjoyment of it so much more. You do have to have like a little bit of suspension of belief because there are a few moments where like, like good lord Abby, you're, you're running from zombies. There's no time to be like this sweet sentimental child right now. But other than that, I thought it was a really interesting take on the zombie apocalypse and I quite enjoyed this book. I thought it was worth it. Now this one does have a prequel to it, but it's only like a few pages and it gives you a little bit more of like dimension to the characters. So that's why I decided to put it on this list anyway. The Casual Vacancy by J.K. Rowling. And this book follows a small town. Like this whole town is just trying to figure out how to fill in the pieces after pretty much like the one good character died. Once he died, there's this casual vacancy and someone needs to feel, fill his position on the council. So there's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of alcohol, there's self-harm, there's rape. There's abuse, there's emotional abuse, there's just a lot of issues and as the casual vacancy is filled, you find out exactly what Barry did for each of these sections and how it like held the community together. It's definitely not one of those books with like a big bad guy and like an overarching evil overlord and it's very different. And it's very much like a slice of life, a small community as they are trying to put things together. This one actually has like a really low rating, relatively speaking, on Goodreads. I can kind of see why. This is not Harry Potter, and I feel like that's something that a lot of people went into the book expecting. I think you should really go into this one not thinking that J.K. Rowling wrote it. Oh gosh, I think her last name might be Rowling. I thought the different characters were all awful in their own way. It made for a very interesting story, and I quite liked it. For the most part, I think this one is worth the pages. I listened to the audiobook and the audiobook was extremely well done as well, so there's that. And we also have The Chemist. This one is by Stephanie Meyer and this one was a little bit difficult for me. So this one follows an ex-agent turned rogue. She has to team up with a few people and she has to find a case to clear her name. And she's like this uber scientist, which like as a fellow scientist, I really don't believe half of the stuff she did. So like for me, it kind of took me out of the book, the realism factor. And it's kind of like a pseudo spy novel, a little bit of a thriller. And it was a long book. And I feel like if the author would have cut out like 100 to 200 pages, we would have had like a very snappy book and a very quick action. But because it was longer, it ended up taking a long time for me to get through it. And there's too many bits of inaction that it did not work for me. And I guess like the other thing with The Chemist was it just felt so dramatic. And it felt so almost over the top with the spy stuff. Like it just was, it was too much. 
So next we have American Gods by Neil Gaiman. This one clocked in at 522 pages, and if we want to get really technical here, it does have a sequel, and the sequel doesn't really pick up where this book left off and it follows different characters, so it's more of like a companion novel than a sequel, I feel. So therefore, I'm putting it on this list. Gaiman, he's very much hit or miss with me, and I read almost every book he's published with the exception of some of the comic books, and this one is definitely one of my favorite, if not my favorites. Ah, this one is like, it's hard to describe, it's very much an experience. So in American Gods, there are two types of gods. There's the old gods, and those are the ones that brought over by the immigrants as they settled America. And then there's the new gods, the ones that were created by their descendants. The new gods and the old gods are clashing. There's a storm coming. Caught in the crossfires is Shadow, and he's an ex-prisoner. He ends up kind of playing an important role. Absolutely loved it. I loved it. So I think it's like such an interesting concept. For me, it was very much worth the pages. And I even read the extended edition, and that was also very much worth it. So I really enjoyed American Gods. A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. This one is 544 pages. Bill Bryson starts off at the Big Bang and then goes up to the modern times. And he talks about the different ways the world evolved and you kind of walk away learning a lot about everything, but you also kind of want to go back in and read it again because there's just so much there's no way you can catch it all at once. So I really like how Bill treats all these concepts because I feel like a lot of the times they become extremely long and they become extremely difficult to kind of condense and still make it interesting. But he still manages that really, really well, and I feel like it worked very well for me as a story. So I thought this one was very much worth it for me. <sighs> All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doer. Okay, so before I get into this one, I have to kind of explain something here. I am extremely particular when it comes to war books. I'm not someone who really enjoys um, reading about war, and I'm not someone who feels particularly comfortable when war is made beautiful, when it feels like someone's trying to make a buck off of a tragedy. For me, like that just, I never quite liked that treatment. In the book, All the Light We Cannot See, it follows two people. One is a little blind girl and her father, and like there's this whole subplot about like this powerful diamond. And the other one follows a Hitler youth individual and then like his story as the two of them get closer and closer to meeting. So then the problem I had was one, we spent so much time building towards the meeting of these two characters. So you switch perspectives and you get a little bit of this one and it's very clear that they're getting closer and closer and closer. Once they finally get together, it's very much of like a, oh, okay. <laughs> It happened. I thought it would be like a lot more to the story there. And then the other thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way is the way this book was written, it had a heavy emphasis on flowery language, beautiful words, and phrases that kind of like, it's supposed to like kind of get you in just like the way to make you cry. And for me that didn't work because I, I just feel kind of uncomfortable with books that try and turn a horrendous event into like a poetical love story sort of thing. It felt like the author wanted to turn a tragedy into a best-selling book and then make a lot of money off of it. And if you got something different out of this book, like that's wonderful and I'm really happy that you enjoyed it. But for me, it just seemed to trivialize the whole situation a little too much. Next we have The Book Thief, and that one is by Marcus Suzak, and it is 552 pages. This is like another book set during the war. You have Liesel, an orphaned girl who has to live with a foster family right before the Nazis take over Germany. She's always had like a peculiar attachment to books, and she kind of picks up books here and there, hence The Book Thief. Meanwhile, there is death, like actual death personified, 
and he has had a peculiar interest in Liesel her entire life. So we see Liesel through Death's perspective, which is a very interesting dimension. I also feel like there's a lot of potential with Death as a creature being and the way he was watching Liesel. I thought there was gonna be a lot more happening with that. But he ends up just kind of being like a little bit of a narrator in the background, kind of over her shoulder. And not as much like sort of interaction sort of thing. Which ended up being a little bit disappointing for me. This is not the biggest issue, but like it did kind of bug me. If you're calling a book the book thief, there should be a lot of thievery of books. The author was like picking out the most important books of Liesel's life. And those are the ones she stole. However, like I went into the book thinking that this book was just gonna be Liesel, like on the undercover missions, saving books from Nazi burning, which ended up being like very much not what the book was about. This one I am actually a lot more okay with rather than all the light we cannot see. This one felt like it treated the subject better and in a more comprehensive way. It wasn't trying to create a, like a pseudo romance, pseudo poetical sort of take on the war. It was very realistic. That being said, like I'm not a person who particularly enjoys war books, so I'm happy I read this one just to kind of quell my curiosity, but I don't think I'll ever be returning to it. If you're curious about it, I would say worth it to try once, and then after that, call it good. The last book I'm going to talk about is the longest book that I have read in a very long time that's not attached to a series. The Host by Stephanie Meyer. In this world, there are these creatures from outer space called souls. They take over a host's body, whatever planet they've invaded, they take over the host. And then they essentially just kind of live out the host's life. The human world didn't really realize what was happening until it's pretty much too late. So pretty much the whole world has been taken over by these souls and there's only a few remaining hosts, aka humans, who are like wild out there. Melanie Strider, she is a young woman, ends up getting captured. Wanda gets inserted into Melanie, and Wanda's expectation is to figure out where the rest of the humans are hiding. And there's just something about this story. Like every time I read it, I just fall in love with it all over again. And I just love the different characters. I thought they were extremely well done. So I really, really enjoyed this book. Now, a few of you might be saying, ah, 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 ah. This is a series, Miranda. It clearly says in Goodreads, the host won. However, comma, it has been a very long time since this book was published and we have not seen anything else coming from Stephanie Meyer. So I'm gonna treat this as a standalone. It feels like a standalone. The ending does leave it a little bit open for another book, but like Stephanie has had the chance and she has not taken it. Fun, 110% worth it. Even if you were like, oh, I don't like Twilight, Twilight is so dumb. This book really holds well. And I feel like it's just such a interesting story that no matter what, Everyone I've known who's read it has absolutely loved it. All right, so that covers the big boys that I have read within pretty much like the last three or four years and whether or not I thought they were worth the time. Okay, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye.